Hello and welcome to the first ever edition of Coasting with Piv and Finer. I'm Evan Pivnik. Piv, if you want to throw that in the middle, that's David Fine. David, well, or Finer, I'll call you. We know each other well. Uh, we're happy to be here, presented by Flow Sports. Um, definitely an interesting year, David. I mean, we are unfortunately not being able to do our jobs, but luckily we're able to talk to other people, our close friends and, and their colleagues about what they're able to do and in, in them covering uh, ECHL teams this year. Yeah, for sure, Evan. Uh, first off, it's great to see your face because normally it would be uh, it would be an in-person face-to-face in either yep. uh, the Cool and Sharing Arena or Santander Arena. For those that don't know, Evan is the wonderful voice of the Adirondack Thunder and myself for the Reading Royals uh, in non-pandemic times. But as a result of the uh, Royals and Thunder not playing, we figured, hey, let's bring you some the inside scoop, the stories that you might not get a chance to talk to the players about at the post-game autograph session or seeing them out and around the community because the ECHL 11 has done a wonderful job of making sure that the teams that are playing are being put in a position to play in a safe way, which is why we talked to the South Division today. We highlight two members of the South Division in Garrett Sparks, goaltender for the Orlando Solar Bears, and then uh, Andrew Lord, the new head coach of the Greenville Swamp Rabbits. Yeah, we're, I'm really excited to talk to both those guys. Just kind of two newcomers, in a sense, to the ECHL, kind of the newer ECHL. Uh, Garrett Sparks did spend some time in the ECHL. So did Andrew Lord. But I think the league has definitely uh, risen up since uh, since those guys uh, have laced up in the Premier AA Hockey League. Uh, one of the things that we're definitely going to hit on is, you said it, just how different of a season this is. And we want to dive into what players and coaches are thinking when it comes to one of the things I think is so important in pro hockey is the camaraderie of these teams. And it's so hard now because guys don't have the opportunity to really socialize with their teammates. I know after a game, a lot of teammates go and they have dinner, they go get some drinks, they go unwind. And that's how the team camaraderie and the chemistry builds. But it's going to be really different this year. Yes, uh, the ECHL, their, their safety measures. There's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, different aspects of why they're and how they're trying to keep the players safe. But the ultimate why is because they want to make sure that we get off the ground and have a full 72-game season for the 13 teams that are scheduled to start. can't believe I'm saying this, but it's just later this week uh, going on Friday. And so as a result of that, with those five games that are going to be played on Friday, Greenville and South Carolina in the South Division and Jacksonville and Florida – in the South Division, plus the other two teams we mentioned. And this is based off of there's geographic limitations and divisional limitations. So in the Central Division, Indy and Wheeling are the only two teams in the Central. You have five teams in the uh, the South Division, and then you have six teams going in the Mountain Division. And a lot of it, of course, is based off of what is allowed in what state, and if you can have fans, can't have fans, um, and how many you can have. In particular, when we talk about Orlando and Greenville, Greenville can have 4,000 fans in the building. And Orlando, I'm not sure of the exact percentage uh, that they that the Orlando Magic, their ownership group, ultimately decided on, but it's more friendly. And I think that in being able to have fans there, you'll be able to really get the sense of not only the fans that are so excited to get back to normal and getting to see their pro hockey teams play, but it's going to make for a fun atmosphere, I think, in the building, though socially distant at that for those teams. Absolutely, because, you know, people are just itching to get out and, and get back to somewhat normalcy. I know so many people here in Glens Falls, they would have done anything to have an Adirondack Thunder hockey game on a Saturday night. And, I mean, me as well, you, you know, we've all been cooped up, still uh, cooped up, in our uh, houses, socially distanced uh, for the past well seven months, but it's just been uh, people have kind of lost their, you know, their passion for what they usually have or just normal life in general. I mean, you know, think about how many times you just want to go out to eat and oh, I can't go out to eat now. They're, you know, just the normalcy of you know after you know the Royals play the Thunder, let's go have a beer. We can't, you can't do that anymore. But I know it, it's there's reasons for everything in place. And uh, obviously the, the rules have to be definitely followed because in the end that will help everything and the light at the end of the tunnel. But uh, you know, fans have to understand that as well. And that's why we're doing what we're doing to make sure that we kind of convey these players stories, these coaches stories and, and fill you in with some, uh, some good ECHL news. I'm excited for the, the new 
uh, flow hockey affiliation with the ECHL, which is bringing every regular season and playoff game live. And I think it shows also because so many of the, uh, uh, the commitment that flow has Mike Ashmore's done a wonderful job writing stories as well as Jason Garente. And there's been a few others in there as well, I believe that have helped to bring the written portion. So we're excited that flow hockey has enlisted the audio and video portion uh, as well to allow us. And as, as a reminder, flowhockey.tv is the website. You can fly, follow them at Flow Hockey on Twitter. And uh, if you want to sign up, and we encourage you to go sign up for your favorite ECHL team, and you can get your subscription package and make sure that you're dialed in to your favorite squad as well. And I think now is as good of a time as any to toss it to our first interview of the day. We talked to Garrett Sparks, the netminder for the Orlando Solar Bears, a Calder Cup champion when he played for the uh, Toronto Marlies of the American Hockey League and one of the best goaltenders to come through the Orlando organization. And now he's back for another season down in sunny Florida. Continuing on with the episode here of Coasting with David Fine, I'm Evan Pivnik, joined by Orlando Solar Bears goaltender Garrett Sparks. Garrett, thanks for hopping on with us today. Thanks for having me. No problem. Well, one of the things we want to talk to you about right away, obviously you're in the ECHL with Orlando. Um, coming from the AHL, the NHL, what kind of guided you towards that decision to play this year with the Orlando Solar Bears? Uh, you know, I, uh, I love playing hockey. So first and foremost, uh, I'm a hockey player. Any opportunity I get to play, uh, typically I have a hard time turning down, whether it's a uh, men's league or a summer skate or, you know, whatever it is. Like I like to just be on the ice. And uh, I, I hadn't played a game since March, um, and I just didn't see any real signs of life from the NHL or AHL as to those two leagues playing anytime soon. Um, and have uh, and have an opportunity really to sign an NHL deal out of free agency either. So uh, you know my rights were available, and I was looking to play somewhere. And I was looking to stay in North America and stay local and and go somewhere where I felt like it gave me a good opportunity to train and, and get ready for uh, whatever next season might hold. Um, and I thought Orlando was a perfect place to do that. It's a fluid situation. You could end up in, you know, any potential market in the ECHL, but Orlando's a place that you're very familiar with and the weather isn't too bad in December. So how much did the familiarity, especially given the situation in the world, factor into why you wanted to return to Orlando? Uh, I mean, I would say I'm somebody who prefers a familiar situation. So I know what I'm getting into. Uh, I know, you know, what is going to be expected of me and like what I can expect out of, you know, the people that I know here. Um, I knew that I was getting uh, Adam Dexter, who I, I find to be one of the best equipment managers in hockey um, and a good friend from my first time here. So it was exciting to come back and see him. Um, I knew that Drake had done a great job here over the last four years with guys and uh, people really enjoyed playing for him. So that was uh, a bit of a no brainer. Um, I knew that, Orlando's practice facility, the RDV, was uh, probably nicer than, you know, most AHL or NHL facilities. So I knew that, uh, you know, the state of Florida, for the most part, uh, would allow us to continue to train, whether, you know, um, until like a full lockdown order got put in place, you know, I'd at least have the gym space and, and ice to stay ready for whatever. And, uh, you know, I, I just think that, it's a uh, vitamin D is an important thing. You know, you go down to the sun and, and you get to regroup and enjoy life. And uh, you know, an opportunity to play hockey and enjoy life in 2020 is like really all you can ask for. So take me back to March. You mentioned it before when everything kind of shut down in March, what were your first kind of thought processes going through your mind when you see the NHL shut down and then you see the minor league team shut down as well? what is your thought process? And as the whole pandemic has gone on your mindset in terms of, well, I need to get back on the ice. I need to be able to do what I need to do to make uh, a living and still continue my career. Yeah. I mean, uh, I had a pretty trying season last year in the AHL. Uh, I started out really well over the first 10 games. And then I don't think I won a game for my next like 15 starts or something. So, uh, you know, it was a very up and then down, and, uh, you know, by, by January, 
February, March, like I, I felt like I was really starting to come on again and, and, you know, uh, play well down the stretch. And uh, I was looking forward to, you know, being a part of a, a tight playoff race in the AHL and, you know, every game mattered and every start was exciting at that point. So uh, when we got shut down, it was a, kind of a buzzkill because I felt like I'd kind of brought my season back from the dead a little bit and I was starting to gain momentum again. And I felt like I could continue to push and continue to play into the playoffs and maybe make some noise there and see what happened. And uh, so it was just, it, I kind of felt like I got cut down right in the middle of like a, a renaissance of sorts. And uh, it was, it was brutal because uh, I was really starting to enjoy playing hockey again and I was having fun with it. I was living at home. I was playing pro in my hometown and it was all over in a second. And it just really made me step back and realize you know, how fortunate we are to be able to get to do this every day and show up to the rink. And, um, you know, I, I was, I guess I'd say a bit lost after that because I wasn't really sure what was going to happen with the NHL and the bubble situation. Um, and, you know, about a week into quarantine, I got a call from Vegas and they told me they weren't interested in resigning me. Uh, so I was like, you know, a week into this whole uncertainty, and your NHL team basically is like, yeah, we're not really interested in you anymore. Uh, so I knew I was basically heading to free agency in a very uncertain time. And, uh, you know, everything was super up in the air. And for a couple of weeks, I kind of just sat back and I thought, like, you know, what, what, what's the proper next move here? You know, because it's the first time in your life, really, you don't have a team telling you what to do. Um, mm -hmm. And it's on you to figure out what is going to make you attractive to your next suitor and uh so after about six weeks of not really doing anything uh I called my agent and I said hey uh I want to get in the gym with Ian Mack who is uh he's a trainer out of Chicago he works with Pat Kane he works with Austin Matthews he works with Roman Yossi he's got some of the best players in hockey uh his training's very alternative it's very much body weight based and movement and, you know, your strength within yourself. And uh, it's it just, it's, it's nothing like you're going to see anywhere else. But I figured if, if guys of that caliber were trusting him, you know, with their careers, I figured the best thing I could do for my career would be invest myself in that. And I did that from, I want to say mid May, till I left home um, like after Thanksgiving. So I was just in the gym about five days a week working with Ian and, and just, you know, taking the time to, you know, reprogram my body, reprogram my movements, uh, you know, take care of past injuries, uh, you know, make sure that things were truly moving the way that they were supposed to move again. Because, you know, I'd played hockey professionally for six years already. I'd put a lot of mileage on my body and done a lot of damage. And I just never – I didn't think we'd ever have uh, a break like that again to focus on retooling your body basically for the next uh, half of your career. It's interesting too because uh, I've heard some players, whether with Reading or, you know, other organizations talk about – that hey, getting through the off season, especially if your team doesn't make the make the postseason, is a really long off season. And the first few weeks, it's important to decompress, like for any player. But yeah, this is you know nine months, eight and a half months before you get in the car and you drive to Orlando. So over the course of month three of your training, um, month four of your training outside Chicago, what are you? what is going through your mind when there's uncertainty to boot about whether this whole thing's actually going to happen in the first place? Uh, man. And that's, that's exactly it. Right. Is you're, you know, you're in the gym with no set timeline of return, uh, no team to return to, uh, no, you know, prospects, no, nobody's talking to you. Nobody's got money to spend on you. It's, you know, so you're, what I really came down to is I was doing it for myself as a person, as, you know, as somebody who'd sustained a lot of injuries through hockey and knew that they had to do things to, to make their body start to move uh, great again, because that was one of my strengths when I was younger is my movement, 
my flexibility, my range were all things that were, you know, uh, huge positive attributes in my game. And as my career went on, you know, you, you pull things and tweak things and things get tight and, you know, you use the same muscles over and over and over and over again. And you have to take the time off to let those uh, movement patterns kind of settle down. And then you have to retrain everything from scratch. And uh, yeah, I would say it was just a very, it's a very therapeutic, slow, meticulous process. Uh, you know, just getting in tune with my body and feeling everything and uh, taking the time to, to rest properly, but also work properly. How has the new training been working in, in terms now of in training camp already have preseason done? How is everything responding so far? I feel really good. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm heavier than I typically am. Uh, I feel like my frame is more built out. Uh, I just feel bigger. Like my posture and that's completely different. Um, and this is, I would say like my first, uh, full week of like playing goalie in a team setting in nine months. And, you know, I, I would expect everything to be howling a little bit more after that kind of break, but I really do feel good. So I would say it was well worth it. And, uh, you know, the, the relief, um, the, the happiness of being in training camp. And the thing I always think of the first time you get a chance to see the boys in the room is there's an excitement in a, in a normal year. But what words would you describe uh, the first week, week and a half of you're getting set to start a season in just a few days at this rate? Yeah, it just, uh, it just started to feel normal again, right? I would wake up mid-September at home. And just kind of feel like I shouldn't be here. I've never been here this time, not in the last 10 years. Like, I'm usually on the road. I'm somewhere else at this point. And so it was just weird. Like, the September, October month, like, those two months were, I would say, definitely the hardest part of the quarantine because you're just ready to be playing hockey at that point. And it's, it's not happening anywhere. So uh, I would say the, the way that I got through that is uh, I took the time to myself. I, uh, I went on this nice uh, week-long road trip around the western U.S., just saw some stuff, got some fresh air, uh, you know, explored some areas that I've always been interested in. And uh, Jesse actually texted me on that trip, and he asked me if I was interested in doing a podcast with him for the Bears. And I responded, I was like, I need a job. <laughs> I need to play somewhere. So... Uh, I'd love to do the podcast, but I'd also like to come play if you could somehow make that work. And it worked out uh, worked out great for you. So take me through yeah. like the first week of you walking into the dressing room. And it's got to be strange because the guys in the locker room are like your brothers for the season. You get so close to them and you pretty much know everything that's going on. And you kind of work together on and off the ice in, the way, in a way. But now it's, you know, it, it's socially distanced. Uh, everyone kind of has to do things differently. Does that change any of the camaraderie in the locker room or did you guys find a way or are still trying to find a way to make sure that all works? Well, I like to think that, uh, you know, things are as normal as they can be here. Um, obviously we're all wearing masks around the room when we're near each other and, uh, we're taking all the proper precautions that the league's mandating. And, and that's because we want to stay healthy and we want to play hockey. You know, we don't want, we don't want this, uh, you know, this endeavor that the league's undertaking to attempt to play. We don't want to see that go to the wayside because, you know, people don't want to take the proper precautions. Like that's, that's one thing that I think as a team we decided pretty early was like, we're going to, we're going to see this thing through. We're going to be serious. We're here to play hockey, you know, in a normal year. Yeah. Maybe you have a little bit more fun outside of the rink, but like you can still enjoy yourselves and enjoy being together in a team environment which is just something that's a privilege at this point. There's 13 teams in North America playing right now. So to be a part of one, I think, is an incredible privilege. You said it, but the captain and the alternate captain and the leadership of a team, however far it extends, might be more important in this case in trying to make sure that the guys are all on the same page. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I would say that we have good veteran leadership here. Uh, you know, I walked in day one, and it didn't take me long to figure out who was running the ship and, you know, who was leading by example and uh, who was just here for training camp. You know what I mean? It was, you know, we had a lot of bodies initially, and 
uh, it was easy to tell for me uh, kind of who was going to be with us down the stretch and who was going to comprise, you know, the core of this team. And I think that all those guys, uh, they don't say much, but they lead by example. And, and that's, I think, what you want to see out of uh, your leadership group is you don't have to be telling guys what to do or what not to do. You just do what you know you should be doing and people will follow. Well, Gary, you said it right there. Do it. Basically, it's, like, it's the do your job mentality. You know, you're, you're there for a reason. You need to get the job done and you make sure everyone else is on the same page. Garrett, man, thanks for joining us here. Best of luck this season. Hope to talk to you soon and uh, stay safe. Thank you. You too, guys. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed talking with Garrett. Uh, he seems very introspective, Evan, uh, someone that's keenly aware of the, the privilege that he has playing pro hockey. And uh, that's part of the reason I'm excited to talk to Andrew Lord next as well. But what do you think about talking with Garrett? It was really awesome talking to him just to get kind of his perspective on things. And especially as a goaltender, I love talking to goalies because, you know, everyone who's kind of met a goalie knows they think a little bit more outside the box than a player would. And that's nothing against anyone else. That's just the way kind of it, it all works. Um, but Garrett was awesome. And, and it's really cool that he took the approach where he said, okay, you know what? I could spend some time in the ECHL. Um, I, you know, when everything got canceled in March, I was playing some of my best hockey. I felt the best. He invested in himself during the pandemic and got himself feeling better. Um, I thought that was really cool the way he uh, took the time to really make himself better. And he said, you know, I have a lot of miles on me. And I, he thinks he's, he still has more to go. So he has some stability that he's going to be actually playing this year. He said he was privileged to be one of the part of one of the 13 teams in North America that's playing pro hockey. So uh, I'm excited to see him on the ice this year, and hopefully we can have him uh, back on again. And he forms one of the top goaltending duos potentially in Orlando. Uh, first of all, having him an AHL Calder Cup champion and someone that put up just ridiculous numbers in the 2018 Calder Cup playoffs is going to boost uh, any, any team's roster. Uh, and I'm excited for our next interview with Andrew Lord, head coach of the Greenville Swamp Rabbits. He uh, comes over from Cardiff in the, in the UK, Cardiff in Wales. It's on the southeast co uh, southwest coast, I should say, of the- Come on, uh, get, your, get your geography together, <laughs> man. Why don't, you, why don't you know this? It would be like comparing Los Angeles to New York, or southeast to north, <laughs> southwest to northeast. Uh, but no, from the southwest portion of the UK in the, in the Wales region, in Wales in the UK. And uh, I'm excited to talk to him. So let's, without further ado, jump into Andrew Lord, head coach of the Greenville Swamp Rabbits. Andrew, it's uh, great for you to hop on with us. First off, season's getting closer. Starting this week, how uh, surreal is it for you that all of a sudden this thing is here and you're going to be playing hockey for real starting this weekend? Yeah, thanks for having me first and foremost. Um, I, I, like I said offline, um, one of the lucky ones right now. Feeling very fortunate uh, to be where I'm at, where our team's at, uh, to get an opportunity to play, because as we all know, not uh, not many people, not many teams get to do that right now. And it was really fun to have that preseason game the other night. Uh, I think it was a real, you know, monumental success. Uh, safe, uh, distanced, some fans in the building. Um, really fun to get back out there. It had been, been a very long time. So now that we're going to ramp it up into the real thing, I'm even more excited. and. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a great time to, to be in hockey and, again, couldn't feel more fortunate. Now, let's go back to you taking the job here with, uh, with Greenville. What, dis what made the decision for you to, uh, to come over? You were coaching in Cardiff or with Cardiff over in, uh, in Europe. What made the decision for you to come back to North America? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a brutally hard decision. I won't get into all the details, but it was, it was really tough. I had a great spot there. Um, four owners and our president there, just unbelievable men. They took care of me, uh, father figures, almost like brothers as well. And uh, just for me to kind of cut my teeth as a new coach there for six seasons was very, very lucky. Um, great fan base there as well. We had a lot of success also, which was fun, uh, but it was time. Um, I, I, you know, my dream is to coach in the NHL. Like I'm sure every coach you interview will say, uh, but it, it really is. And I had to, I had to see what I can do, to be honest. And that, that was literally what it came down to. Uh, and then when you mix in great ownership on this side with Spire Sports Entertainment, um, our president, Todd Mack, and the staff here, when I started the interview process and, and met all of them, I, I knew it was uh, going to be very difficult to turn down. And, um, yeah, again, it's uh, funny how it's all worked out. Um, 
got here and, and getting able to, to be a part of actual hockey right now, again, very lucky. What jumps out to you about the Greenville community, even though it's a pandemic and maybe it wouldn't be the full experience, but also um, the fan base, the community, and you already said the ownership about what hockey and the culture of hockey is like in Greenville, South Carolina? Yeah. What's, what's interesting is there's, there's so many parallels to uh, here now to six, seven years ago when I, when I took the Cardiff job. Uh, new ownership, great people, uh, you know, willing to do whatever it takes to, you know, support the community, the staff, the players, to do things the right way. Um, and then, you know, meeting the people in and around the community has been fantastic. Obviously, it's been a little challenging with the pandemic. I can't wait to see it when it gets back to normal. But overall, you know, there's a lot of love for, for the sport, uh, sports in general in this community, uh, and particularly our team. And, and you know, there, there is a loyal following. I think uh, it needs to come back a bit. I think it needs to grow a bit as well, obviously. We're going to be gunning to do that. But there is a, a good little core and there's some great people that love the game. And, and we're going to build, uh, build on that here going forward. So you take the job in Greenville, and then a few weeks later, you start seeing guys coming back from Europe to go play for you. What is that like, knowing that you have guys that, that you know know you so well and trust you uh, to be their coach that they're coming over, back overseas to uh, to play for you? Yeah, this this last uh, five months. I mean, the twists and turns. It's been you, you couldn't write it honestly. Uh, I leave. I say all my goodbyes, um, and then. All of a sudden, next thing you know, the UK league's done. Other team, other leagues in Europe, um, they're playing, but they just don't have as many imports. They're not willing to bring as many guys over because of the pandemic. Um, and you know, once the UK league uh, went down, uh, started to have talks with a few of our guys, and you know, we weren't sure at first if if they were going to be able to play. Um, then, when it was completely confirmed that they couldn't, um, you know, we kept continuing on some talks and. It was just a great fit from both sides. Um, for me to have four guys I really trust that are going to you know, lead by example, show the young guys how we do things, um, know how I operate. Uh, it, I, I couldn't be more thankful to have that opportunity. I think that's going to be huge. You know, I'm coming back from Europe after seven years. It's a huge transition overall. To have some stability there is great. Uh, and then on the flip side, for them to, to continue to get to play here when so many guys aren't playing, uh, I think it's, you know, fortunate for them. So it was a win-win both sides. And uh, I can tell you, we're, we're really excited to be back at it uh, all together and uh, a little bit like old times, uh, less of you guys, obviously. It's uh, interesting because I, I love hearing from coaches about how they recruit guys, especially when you're trying to recruit uh, people to a place like in Cardiff, where it may have been a little bit off the map for North American guys and guys might not know where it is on the map in Wales uh, until they maybe pull up Google or you start getting into talks to them. But what's, what's your go-to as a recruiter when you're trying to get a guy on the phone, what are the, some of the key things that you're bringing up that you think will help sell someone to come to Greenville or to come to any of the, uh, your past spots or Cardiff in particular? Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to give you the whole blueprint obviously, but uh, <laughs> I'll give you some snippets. And um, I mean, I, I, I think you get what you see with me, um, you know, Try to, I am an honest guy. I, I like, uh, you know, hard work. I like intensity. I like passion for the game. Um, you know, similar, I think I brought some of my uh, playing characteristics to my coaching philosophy to some extent. Uh, detail oriented guys that want to learn. Uh, just all those sort of buzzwords. Um, you know, if you're like that, if you're like that as a player, this spot's for you. It's not for everyone, I'll be totally honest, but. Uh, for the guys it is for, I think it's a really good setup. And, and I've seen a lot of a lot of players grow over the years and, and really, you know, reach their potential and get better and better year in and year out. Uh, and that, as a coach, is, is very fulfilling when you're able to work with people and improve, help improve them and give them a foundation to, you know, better themselves as both, you know, a player and a person. So uh, that, that would probably be a, a bit of the sales pitch. There's obviously a little bit more than that. Uh, but, yeah, maybe that answers uh, somewhat. I have a question for you when it, when it comes to your approach coaching, and this is kind of uh, going back to your, your days. Oh, you were a player with Cardiff, and then all of a sudden, one year you're now the head you're now the head coach, and you're playing 
Was that a strange transition for you just from a locker room standpoint? Because I'm sure you have guys that, you know, your brothers in arms, you're in the locker room, you guys are, you know, just the, just the boys in the room. And then all of a sudden they come in the next year and you're still one of the guys in the room, but you're also, you know, you're the head coach of the team. Does that change any of the relationships that you had with players or did it kind of just all stay the same and you have a good level of trust? Yeah, I mean, it was insane, to be honest. Looking back, it was uh, pretty comical. Uh, I was donned the name Reg Dunlop, obviously, from Slapshot for those couple years and rolled with it. I, I like to think we were a little more professional with, with video and prep work, and uh, we weren't just hitting the bar all the time. So, um, I mean, that was an incredible experience for me to, to again, cut my teeth. Uh, very challenging for a lot of those same reasons that you just brought up. Um, you know, the, the dynamic, uh, trying to run a practice, trying to still do the practice a little bit, trying to run a bench when you're playing. Uh, there was a lot of, a lot of interesting aspects to it. Um, it was, you know, very demanding on the body as well from, you know, standpoint, but looking back, it was a great experience. Um, you know, I think the huge thing was we had such great people there. Uh, our players were just they're just awesome guys and they got it. They got what we were trying to do. We had a new ownership group come in. Uh, the team was barely surviving the, the previous years. We were just trying to do something creative budget wise to kind of keep the team afloat and to make it work. And um, the boys bought in and, and they really helped me out. They went to bat for me. I think they understood, you know, the demands and what was going on. And, and overall it worked really well for a couple of years. And then, you know, we were able to get momentum and, fans came back and then we got a new building and the budget changed and, and then we were on our way and uh, I had to hang them up and, and turn into a real coach but uh, overall some, some real fond memories when you bring that up. Was that something that they came to you and said hey we want to make you uh, the head coach or was that something you kind of lobbied for a little bit in the back of your mind you knew that something you wanted to get into and was it the time the kind of timing sort of a thing or right place right you know, what was the kind of situation? It was that, wild. That finally I, mean, came it was, I had a contract from another team in the league that I you know, probably, you know, for about a month, I almost signed and I just kind of kept pushing it off. And I was really lucky. A guy by the name of Neil Francis, he played for Cardiff. Uh, he coached in Cardiff. He's now he works for the organization. He's been there, you know, his entire life. He, he He's the face of the franchise really. And he kind of was behind the scenes working a lot of different angles. Um, and he just kind of kept me and some other guys in play, you know, just because we saw the potential in the city, um, in the fan base, in all of it. We just knew we needed to get um, some solid ownership in there. And he kind of just kept telling me to hang on. Um, I thought it was just for playing. Uh, and then they needed a coach and, and they, they brought it to me. And then luckily I, I knew our um, president, he came over from Belfast, another team in the league. He knew me as well a little bit, and, and it just kind of was a triangle there, and it all worked out. And yeah, it was it happened happened real fast, and uh, it was just a wild ride, really. I know Twitter isn't real life, but if there's any indication, the fan base is just unbelievable over there in Cardiff, and uh, at least based on their engagement of any tweet that mentions uh, the Greenville Swamp Rapids or your name at this point, so. What the heck makes the, the Cardiff fan base so p passionate about their team? And I can't believe – it's almost unbelievable to think how amazing of a fan base that it is, at least based on what we're seeing on Twitter. It's exciting. It's wild. I mean, the, the, the first season I was there, I was just a player uh, with the old regime. And, I mean, we were having five, six, seven hundred 700 people in the building – um, we kind of kept hearing it was, you know, it was a historic team. They had a lot of success in the past. Um, there was a, a good fan base back in the day. Uh, and then, you know, I think when things just started rolling, they, they came back and there was a new belief and, um, you know, it just, it just spiraled out of control from the old fan base being renewed and rejuvenated to then, I think our, our organization, our off-ice staff did an incredible job getting out in the community and, and back to kind of the, players being, you know, great guys. They were at the school visits doing all those different things. And uh, the amount of ch kids we had at games by, you know, year four or five and six was wild. Hundreds of kids and, you know, what that brings as far as parents and other people to the games. And uh, next thing you know, you're 3,100 uh, stuff full every night and uh, a lot of passion. I think, you know, Cardiff um, sporting community, they got great rugby there. They have great football or soccer as we know it over here. Um, but I think hockey's a nice blend. You get that physicality, you get that skill. 
the amount of people I heard just that it got to one game and then became, you know, lifelong fans. Uh, I heard it again and again and again. And uh, it was a, it was a really neat experience to, to see that in a non-traditional uh, hockey market. Big game Saturday night or whatever the last game of the week is big win for the boys. What's the scene like after uh, for the boys, for yourself, after a big win on a, on a Saturday night or whatever night of the week it is in Cardiff? I mean, it's it definitely a little – it was a little different, uh, me as a coach, than me as a player. I'm sure the guys that knew me as only a player would maybe speak different of me as a, than, than the guys that know me as a coach. But uh, there's some great spots. It's a great city. Um, they love their beers. They love their pubs. Uh, that downtown area, there's, there's a lot to see and do there. And, yeah, I mean, even even the rink, it's it's got a great atmosphere in it. Um, and there's been a, been a lot of special nights there overall. You're no stranger to the ECHL. You played parts of three seasons with the uh, Wheeling Nailers. What are some of your favorite uh, memories from your ECHL playing days? It was great. I mean, the, I can't speak too highly of them now. They're, they're a competitor, but uh, I, had a, I had a lot of fun there. It was a great little city. Uh, you know, the, old, the rink's been rejuvenated from what I've seen on video. Uh, they've got brand new apartments, and it sounds like it's really been changed a lot from the time I was there. But Again, we just had a really nice group of guys, guys that, uh, you know, they were there for the right reasons and we had a lot of fun together. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of good stories, probably can't share on the air, but uh, <laughs> you know, it, was, it was good overall. Uh, I was just really pumped to be playing pro hockey, to be honest, after a pretty shoddy uh, college career. I uh, didn't do all that well and uh, great to make a team and stick and uh, and then eventually moved my way up to the A for a little bit. But, um, no, it was, it was great. It was, it was just fun being in the mix there, uh, you know, those three and threes, the Sunday 2 p.m., finding a way to, to get something done. It was, it was good overall. Well, uh, you mentioned your college playing days. You played at RPI, which I'm in Glens Falls, uh, New York right now, 45 minutes down the street, uh, maybe to an hour. But, you know, the fans up here would not enjoy it if I didn't ask you uh, a question about playing in the capital region for four years. Uh, what did you like your experience with uh, RPI? It was great. Yeah. I, again, uh, it's funny. I, I think I've been with just so many good groups of guys and I've had, I'm, I've had, if you look at the coaches that I've had coach me, I've, I've been really lucky. I've had some unbelievable coaches, some guys in the NHL now, and not, not that that's everything, but just a lot of good people, good, good coaches, good players. Uh, I've been with, you know, that, that, that group there was, was incredible. We weren't very good on the ice, uh, but man, we, we got along and, you know, again, really good times together. Uh, we kind of grew up together, you know, as you would probably know, going through college from one year one to four, you kind of mature together and yeah, really, really fond memories there uh, in a lot of different ways. It's been a blast, Andrew. Good luck this weekend as you guys get it going against uh, your now biggest rivals, the South Carolina Stingrays. And uh, have have a fun time in the in the North American Pro Head Coaching debut. We appreciate you hopping on with us. Thanks, fellas. Have a good one. Well, he was a lot of fun to have on. I know he got to the bottom of your biggest question about the bars in Cardiff. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? The passion and energy that Andrew Lord brings. I mean, if you're a player and you were around that, I think for a little bit, especially the guys overseas coming back. I mean, I probably want to come back too. Yeah, and, you know, you mentioned the players coming back. I think the, the biggest thing that strikes me, Evan, is you can tell he's a positive guy. He's a fun guy to be around, that energy. And it's, it's tough to capture on a, on a Zoom camera, but it felt like the personality and the positivity. And I just think that um, he's, he is built to be an ECHL coach. He's done the recruiting in the EIHL, getting guys to fly overseas to the English League and make sure that they are prepared to either uh, continue their, their careers in Europe or come back over to North American pro hockey. I had a joy, uh, a blast talking with him, joy to have on, really looking forward to uh, getting a chance to talk with him again, maybe at some point this year as the season unfolds and we'll see where the Swamp Rabbits are, are landing. Well, that does it for the debut episode of Coasting with Piven Finer. I'm Evan Pivnik. That's David Fine. David, anything you want to say before we uh, – send these fine people off to whatever else they're doing on the internet. Yeah. Get signed up for the, your new flow hockey subscription, flowhockey.tv, uh, as we mentioned, and uh, can watch all the, all ECHL games and check out some of the great writing on there. I think that the journalism that's been done by, uh, by Jason and Mike, as we said a little bit earlier is wonderful. And uh, I'm looking forward to a nice 
a nice quiet evening and talking to everyone again next week. What about you? Uh, same here. Sign up for Flow Hockey. Um, not too much else going on with me. Probably be sitting in the same spot until the next episode of Coasting. But uh, follow David on Twitter at David Fine Tweets. I think that's what your Twitter handle is, right? Yeah, I can't remember. Evan at Evan Pivnik ADK. Am I right on that's that? That's it. You got it. See, I can't get your email right a lot of times, <laughs> but I can get your Twitter handle right. And that's all that matters nowadays. I guess Twitter, Twitter's real life in that sense. No, Evan, it was a blast. Episode one went off as, as planned and uh, can't wait for, can't wait for next week. I'll be sitting here exactly the same spot until next week. Perfect. Let's just put on smiles and 